in the automotive industry, we're seeing a, a confluence of a number of significant drivers coming together at the right time. So you have a general consumer desire for improvement in sustainability, and you know, most of us recognize that electric vehicles could be better for us than diesel and petrol. Good. Regulators are catching on. So whether it is EU battery regulations, ger the German supply chain law, you know, modern slavery legislation around the world, um, the SEC's proposed ESG uh, reporting standards that they're talking about, even accounting bodies are starting to define how to audit ESG claims. Um, at, and you know, the US's concerns around critical mineral resource security, all these things create a sort of regulatory push that's a very, very, very clear signal to industry. So uh, that's where innovation really starts to take off in my view. You have a combination of innovators, a demand from industrial OEMs like car manufacturers um, to, to understand what it is that they are responsible for. So obviously clearly not just their own operations, but actually everything they buy comes from somewhere. Um, and a recognition that um, you know, the manufacturer of something that's supposed to be better for the planet, like an electric vehicle, um, should not necessarily damage either people or planet in its construction, which is exactly what we do today. Um, hence the need to understand the deeper tiers of the supply chain. That's partly from a, the perspective of responsible sourcing, I mentioned child labor earlier, but also inherited scope three emissions. So that means the emissions of each of the participants along the supply chain in manufacturing a battery or steel or aluminum or sourcing rubber, for example, for tires. Now, when you understand the need for that, the question is, where do you find the data? This data, although it has existed forever, has never been collected and certainly not aggregated through a supply chain. So it starts with the creation of a, a reliable chain of custody. The pressure flows from the, the OEM down through the supply chain to the, to, to the upstream producers, but the data comes from the participants in the supply chain. And what we're doing is creating a digital twin for a commodity at its source, that could be a 200 ton parcel of nickel from a mine site in Western Australia, or it could be a 30 kilo sack of cobalt from the Congo. And then um, following that digital thread from there through the supply chain, and of course the complexity is that a bag of rock is nothing like a car. It's not like tracking a strawberry, which is a strawberry in the field and also a strawberry when it gets to your plate. Um, and so you have to be able to connect the input ingredients to an industrial process to the output product multiple times through the supply chain. I often liken this to a cake recipe. You know, so much flour, so many eggs, so much sugar, goes through a defined mixing process, spends an hour in the oven, and comes out as a cake. If you have 20 cakes, you've clearly added flour from somewhere else. And only a TV chef can make a cake in two minutes. And so, you know, you take that basic principle of code the chemistry and apply it multiple times through the supply chain. Once you move into the manufacture of components and sub-assemblies, obviously, you're dealing more with the, you know, how physical things are combined to create a product. We did this uh, the first time uh, with Volvo cars in 2018 um, to demonstrate that it was possible to follow cobalt, as it happens, all the way through the supply chain from mine to car. Um, and we've expanded that now into all battery materials um, with them and, and other <coughs> car manufacturers. And I mentioned the German Battery Pass project beforehand. The primary supply of raw material is only the first part of the problem. The same raw materials at the end of their first life you know, need to enter not just recycling, but the potential for second and third life uses, like batteries and energy storage systems. So when we're talking about something like a product passport, we're interested not only in the primary supply, the first manufacturer of something, but also the circular economy that can potentially follow. And, and circular economy business models cannot be created without, a data, without data about where is your asset, what is its state of health, potentially who, who's financing it, um, you know, can it be reused or should it be recycled, and it, something certainly EU regulators contemplating, a carbon balance sheet. How much of the carbon that was invested in this thing to make, make it in the first place has been repaid in its first life, and should we therefore use taxation as a way of driving you know, a second life use rather than an immediate recycling, which of course is an investment of more energy in it.